So I'm actually going to be in Genesis chapter 15, and as you make your way there, I have a message. I guess the easy way to talk about this message, which I'm telling, God has a plan. God has a plan for cultural loneliness. I never thought I'd ever have to bring this subject matter up. I never thought I'd have to wrestle with this. I never thought I'd have to address this ever before the people of God. God has a plan, and God has a plan for cultural loneliness. Have you ever noticed there's some lonely people in the Bible? You know, so this is not really a new topic. It's very interesting that I'm bringing it up, but then when you look at the scriptures, you begin to realize this is not necessarily a new topic. Let's just go with the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he had nowhere to lay his head. You know what that means? It means he was lonely. If you want a full theological view of that, you could go to Philippians chapter 2, which is known as the uh, great humiliation of Christ, at least that's what some theologians call it, or the kenosis passage, which says that God had to, in a sense, humiliate himself to squeeze into humanity. And then we preach this at Christmas the whole time, which is really not a bad way of thinking of Philippians chapter 2, the theology of Christmas, but we oftentimes preach this at Christmas about how God had to, had to humiliate himself to actually enter the human race, born in a manger in very humble means. And so, so the Bible talks a lot about loneliness. I've been meditating on the life of David. So David's obedient to the Lord. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. You guys know this story. He goes and he takes care of Goliath. And we don't tell this part of the story in our Sunday school, right? David kills Goliath. No, David actually knocked him out with a bullet. And then he took Goliath's sword and he chopped his head off. And I don't think we go into Sunday school with little flannel graphs. Like, you know, mommy, look what it. <laughs> I, don't think we, I don't think we tell that kind of story. We're age appropriate. But in the context of this text, which is in uh, Genesis chapter 15, I'm referencing Abraham's loneliness. Because in chapter 12, the Bible records that the Lord came, and I'm going to make my way to chapter 15, but in chapter 12, the Lord comes to him. It's great. It's an awesome message. Listen, I want you to go to the land I will show you. Yes? He's in Iran. And so he goes on an incredible journey, and he's going to drop down through the northern part of what we call the Fertile Crescent. He's going to come down to Israel proper. He's going to go into Egypt. And the Lord had told them, you're going to have land, seed, and blessing. But he goes on a journey, and he's not really seeing the land, the seed, and the blessing. Then chapter 13, there's problems. There's problems with this dream and vision God gave him, and so there's problems with Lot. Lot takes off. Genesis chapter 14, he rescues Lot, and then he meets a very interesting character by which we name all of our kids after a guy named Melchizedek. <laughs> so the timeline there, remember, this is God. God has spoken to Abraham. At these, he's Abram, but we'll just go with Abraham. Don't judge me. Have years gone by? Decades have gone by. Decades have gone by. And in earthly terms, when you study the life of Abraham, he's a rich brother. I mean, he, he's, he's got it going on. He actually has money. He has people who work for him. But the promise of God does not seem like it's been fulfilled. I have money. And I go places, and people respect me, or whatever the case is. Sure, you've kept me safe or safe enough. But, you know, where is that land? Because I'm looking around, and we're like a little tribe of maybe 300, and there's a lot of other villages of a few thousand, and they're bigger than us and stronger than us. Like, where's that land? Abraham, his entire life, would live in a tent. Where's that seed? We'll get to that in a moment in our story. Where's that blessing? Jesus was lonely. Cultural isolation is what I'm calling it. David was lonely, not always understood. 
And here Abraham is lonely. And so in verse 17 of the text here, because I'm just going to go through one verse and then we'll get after a few things. The scripture says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Now I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Others of yours might say a flaming oven which I say, man, bring that on. I want to see that. I want to see that flaming oven. So really, when you get into the deep dive linguistically, this is what I love about reading kind of commentators and theologians, and then, of course, you can just study you know, through some basic tools. Let me give you the deep dive on what this smoking pot flaming oven means and what people think it means. Are you ready? We don't know. How do you describe this crazy physical manifestation where what has taken place in this chapter is this. Abraham's lonely. The Lord comes to him in a dream, in a vision. And he has a conversation. Now, Abraham Abraham is going to actually have a conversation with God. Maybe more bold than you and I would have a conversation with God. God comes and he gives him, you know, this blessing, this dream. And then Abraham says, yeah, you know, I haven't really seen it, Lord. Where, where's the air? You, you asked me to go on a long walk. I went on a long walk. You didn't exactly give me a GPS on the phone to tell me where I was going. You said, the land, I'll show you. You're telling me this is the land? There, uh, does it doesn't look like it's my land. It looks like it's somebody else's land. I don't really look like the strong one here. I don't really look like the powerful one here. And by the way, me and my woman, like we are really old now. So the idea of an heir, I'm just, you know, I'm, you know so, so could you help a brother out here? That's a little bit of the backstory. And so the Lord says these great words, these great words to Abram or Abraham soon to be. He says, okay, okay. Time to, time to sort of open up heaven for you. Abram, look up. Can you count them? I mean, can you count them? So shall your descendants be. The heir from your own body, with your wife, that will be my promised seed by which I will create an entire nation that you can't count, by which a Messiah shall someday come. You remember, he was arguing with the Lord. Lonely, unhappy, powerless. So here's what happens afterwards. I've, in the earlier part of this chapter, Abraham believed God, and the text literally says, it was credit to him as righteousness. And so that moment, that very moment, is the foundation of all Scripture looking forward, found in a dissertation in the book of Romans called Justification by Faith. Very foundation of our faith. We're in a place of cultural loneliness so it's been said a couple times this morning, but I'll, I'll give a little repetition to it. We're not very popular anymore. Our global culture doesn't like us that much. Pastor Greg Laurie in the middle of pandemic actually titled a message somewhat like this. It's really fascinating. So the Christian is actually feeling lonely in culture, the the, the coverings that we had, the assumptions that we had are actually no longer present. And so we're experiencing waves and waves of loneliness. Now, loneliness comes to anybody in their human experience. You can be lonely in church. You can be lonely in your relationship with the Lord. You can be lonely in your marriage, in your fellowships, in your relationships. I mean, it's all kinds of different reasons why you can be lonely. And then there's moments of just supernatural grace where God comes to you. I was very lonely as a boy. I was born in the Caribbean in a very small village, actually. Uh, I like talking about my Puerto Rican roots. 
and one phone in the village, not much refrigeration. And so Abuelo Pedro takes me off to the side. My grandfather was a version of Forrest Gump. He actually moved the family to the two places in the Puerto Rican island where the hurricanes did not destroy. Like, he figured that out. If you know anything about the Caribbean, like we had hurricanes and tropical storms and whoosh, things go away. And so he just kind of moved in and there, there, there became a little bit of a financial power position for him. And so he took and bought a few pieces of land. And one day when I'm a young boy, he, he holds up the soil and he's running it through his hands. He's just running it through his fingers. And he says these following words to me are versions of that I, all I have belongs to you, my son. All I have belongs to you. And this is so that you have a place in the world and so that you know that you belong. And so that, that moment was so like seminal for me where I've heard from this patriarch of the family, you know, that, that I belong. I belong in a place despite all of the world's troubles. And so the Lord comes to you and says, you belong to my kingdom. You belong to me. You belong in a place by which I call you. Despite all of the troubles that you might have, despite all of the troubles that you might see, you belong. But let's talk about loneliness a little bit. So on terms of YouTube and Google, this is one of the most popular topics. Uh, NPR says that three out of five people are asking right now actively in our country how they can stop being so lonely. And so I really have kind of two basic outlines I want, to, I want to run for home with and kind of get after with this. I'm going to call this like an inner wave and an outer wave, and I'm going to do this in very short order. The idea of surfing where you have an inner wave and an outer wave. And so related to this inner wave, we want to talk about the kind of culture that we become internally that becomes a witness externally because of a wave. It comes in and it goes out. It comes in and it goes out. And so we are, by Jesus' people, to develop an internal culture amongst ourselves that is revolving around four things. And I'll give you the chapter and verse. The first is justice. The second is freedom. The third is identity. And the fourth is beauty. Related to justice, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that God himself is just and the justifier. So our concepts of justice revolve around the cross. God is just and the justifier. Secondly, related to freedom, Galatians chapter 5 says that for freedom, Christ has set us free. Interesting enough, the very next statement says, do not be subject again to slavery. Yes? Yes. So our cultures in our church, our culture, our Christian experience has a foundation which says that we actually understand justice because God is just and he has actually set us free in Christ. We have freedom, not of ourselves and not of our flesh. We actually have freedom because of Christ. And third, related to identity, so many verses I could give you, but Romans, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2 simply says that we are seated in Christ. So, so many people have identity issues which affect their sexuality, which affect all of the things that Lance Franklin spoke of at the beginning of his talk, and yet the answer to that is to actually be seated in Christ, to be as uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 says, a son or daughter of God, that we have the right to become children of God. And then lastly, beauty, oh boy, how many verses could I give you there? Isaiah chapter 43 has one reference, Uh, Revelation chapter 2, he makes all things new. So have you destroyed your life? Have you destroyed a family? Have you destroyed your business? Have you just gone down to the deepest and darkest and pit of despair kind of place? Well, let me tell you that God can make all things new and make them beautiful. That is our culture that we witness to the world with. That is our culture in Christ that we witness to the world with. And so that's what I'm calling that inner wave. The outer wave goes a little bit like this. First, we should critique culture. So we should say, this is our culture. You're not that. You're not just. You're into power systems. You're not into freedom. Your freedom is laughable. Third, you're really not into identity. Your identities are so errant. They're not even biologically or scientifically or medically consistent. The world's identities are not that. And your idea of beauty, no. We want nothing to do with it. No, thank you. So we should critique culture. But related to that outer wave, we should also understand that our culture right now has a love language. 
And it's an evangelistic love language. It's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's wide open. It's these arms wide open that are saying, please love me. Please love me. Are you a Christian? Here's how to love me. Here's the love language of the world. And I know that we don't see it, which is why I want to address it. It's basically the art of crying. The world wants to know, will you cry with them? They've destroyed themselves. And they're destroying themselves. And let me tell you what we don't do well as Christians. Cry. Crying does not necessarily lack emotion. Sometimes there are very real reasons to cry. And I'm not going to do it right now. We're just preaching right now. So that would be fake and phony and, you know, just an actor. I'm not doing that. But I'm telling you that there are authentic moments in life when we as a culture and as a church don't cry. We sometimes don't even cry when we pray. Think about that. Go through the Bible and find the criers. We hear terrible things, and people come to us with terrible, we don't cry with them. Here's what crying is for biologically. This is actually factually true. Crying biologically is designed to change you. Crying biologically when two people are together is designed to bind them together. Crying biologically when people are in group and crying is actually designed to pull them together. And we often tell people who are hurting or have experienced great loss, stop crying. I'm from the Caribbean. That's why I started very, very much of that point. We're a little bit too much on the other side. A bunch of stinking criers over there in Puerto Rico, you know? <laughs> My grandmother and mother, so in, in Spanish, no te llores is a, you know, don't cry. And so that was, so literally my kids all know this. I, I, I raise them with no te llores, mijo, no te llores, right? Because that's how I grew up, which is just a phrase of like, if something's hard, don't cry. But our culture, the witness outside of these walls is asking, will you weep with me? You don't necessarily see it. Go hang out with those people whose sons and daughters became the things that Lance had with these transgenderisms and all of that. And I'll, and I'll have them in, in, in my office or we'll be talking and they will be saying, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to support my son and daughter. I'm trying to support my son and daughter. Recently I met with somebody and I said, bro, are you hurting about that? Whoosh. Of course. Who who? What parent imagines for their son and daughter all the things that were spoken of earlier? Nobody. And so, sure, a son and daughter is going to try and be, a parent's going to try and be supportive, but they're crying. They're crying at the loss and the fallout, the same fears, and they're saying, will you come cry with me? And sometimes in a magic message is, let me just hold your hand, and I will actually weep with you, because through my, the presence here, Christ will come, and you will understand God, that he's not forgotten you. That's part of the outer wave. I'm going to talk about radical grace and see if I can squeeze this in. This is the last thing related to loneliness. Just after the Civil War, about a decade later, a wonderful young couple of 20-year-olds landed in Dodge City. This was the Wild West. They landed in Dodge City because they had heard that it was so godless and just terrible. Uh, the only place they could go, because there was no places for them to live, was the brothel. And so this young couple, 20 years old, went to live with the prostitutes. And the wife said, I will bathe you girls, I will share my perfume with you, I will sew your clothes, and I will uh, actually do your hair if all of you girls would come to my Bible study. And they said, great, well you can do all of that stuff for me. And uh, we promise that if you do all those things for you, we'll actually go to your Bible study and none of us will sleep with your husband. <laughs> Gospel truth. Seven years later, they experienced an enormous revival. And the town is shut down of prostitution and every other debauchery. Some of this, in terms of some journals, think this is legend, but 
uh, there's probably some truth to that. A man came wanting to sleep with a woman. He put a gun to that pastor, put a gun uh, to the woman, uh, to the wife, and said, I want you guys to leave, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so here's what they said to the man with the gun at their head. He said, God has radical grace for you. Actually, their phrase was, God has true grace for you. The man left crying. Indians came, loving their witness for Christ, and took them away. And to this day, we know that that happened in Dodge City, but we do not know their name. and We never heard from them again. The sweet couple that had radical grace for people. In our cultural loneliness, may God give you bra bravery and courage of radical grace and a true grace for others.